That's Lou. Thanks, uh, thanks, Arunran, and thanks, Josh, for that great introduction. And I, I do want to echo um, Josh's thanks to all the different organizations that helped to uh, get the word out on this Canada ASEAN Week uh, webinar series. We've we've worked with a lot of great Canadian companies and economic development organizations in Canada over the years, and, and we uh, we really hope to be able to do that more in the future. Um, as Josh said, I'm one of the co-founders and the executive director of Tractus Asia. Uh, Arunrad and I have actually worked together for almost a decade, and the two of us together hope to be able to give you some perspective, both from my side as an expatriate, having lived and worked here in Thailand for uh, Josh was being kind over 25 years now, um, and then Arunrat working with us on, on trade and investment issues over the last um, last decade. Just to give you some background on Tractus, uh, we're a we do corporate strategy uh, and FDI investment and attraction advisory and assistance work for multinational companies. Um, and also economic development agents, uh, agencies around the world. We've been doing it for 20, 21 years now. We actually started the company here in, in Thailand and grew out of Thailand into China, India, and then the rest of, of Southeast Asia. My, my remit within the company is to work with the, the teams in Southeast Asia um, in ASEAN, and we're really bullish on the region, both from an investment perspective and, uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a foreign trade perspective. And we hope to today to give you some uh, some ideas and some some background on what the opportunities are for investing in Thailand. We've across the region across Asia, we've worked on about five billion dollars worth of foreign direct investment projects and also trade projects with uh, with economic development organizations. Um, our expertise is in the process of helping companies and organizations make good decisions about where to locate their business and, and how to do do their business in Asia. Um, we've worked across multiple sectors, um, everything from automotive to zeolites and, and just about everything in between. And we've got about 60, uh, 60 employees across, uh, across our eight offices in the region. But moving to Thailand, um, Thailand's a fortunate country in, in many ways. Um, some would say that its, its geographic location in the center of Southeast Asia was one of the reasons that it was never colonized. Um, it acted as a, a buffer between the British in the West and, and the French in the East um, for many years. And some would say that because it was that buffer, uh, that it was lucky. Uh, and others uh, of us that know Thailand really well, um, we chalk it up to more to astute diplomacy. Uh, but it could be a combination of, uh, of the two. But I'd like to think it was uh, Thai's uh, very, uh, very astute diplomacy that, that kept them uncolonized, and, and hence the name. Thailand means land of the free. Uh, many of you may have heard uh, Thailand referred to as Siam, and Siam in the past, but, but its modern name comes from the fact that it was never colonized. Uh, just to give you an idea of some scale, if Thailand was a company, uh, the Thai economy at $395 billion in 2005 would be number two on the Fortune 500, uh, sandwiched between Exxon and, and Walmart. Uh, in terms of purchasing power, uh, the, the minimum wage here is, is $8.45 a day. Uh, and that's about, to give you some perspective, that's about twice as much as its neighbor Vietnam, and about four times as much as, as its low cost, uh, or very low cost uh, location in, in Southeast Asia and Myanmar. Uh, some other perspective on that is back in the early 1900s in the United States, Henry Ford doubled the American uh, automotive workers' wage to about $8 a day. And the reason he did that was to give them money to buy his vehicle. So what we're seeing, uh, minimum wages have been, have been going up. The Thai government has been trying to push them up, just like the Chinese government, putting more money in people's pockets. And we're seeing that uh, consumer a driven growth um, over the last several years. Uh, that translates into a per capita income of about $5,800 a year, which doesn't seem like much, but if looked at on a global scale across many different economies, that's the point with which 
economies start to buy capital goods, consumers start to buy cars, they start to buy uh, condominiums, they start to buy other kinds of consumer capital goods, and you think that that wouldn't be enough money to do that, but typically in Asia you're, you need to look at household income, so if you've got a two wage earner household at $10,000, that is enough uh, to, to start buying those, those types of commodities, and dr that driving in, ter in turn drives economic growth. Another way to look at it is on a purchasing power parity basis, which takes out the foreign exchange rate issues. And if you do that, uh, the average sort of Thai person has over 16,000 US dollars in purchasing power. So if you come to Thailand, you'll see, certainly in Bangkok, uh, it's a quite consumer driven, it's becoming quite a consumer driven economy and that opens opportunities for companies uh, that have uh, products to sell, interesting products to sell. Now, broadly, Thailand is a is economy is really well balanced. Unlike uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other countries, uh, no one sector of the economy dominates. Uh, it's another thing that makes Thailand a, a fortunate country. Um, some of it because of natural resources. Uh, Thailand is known in some in some uh, industry sectors as the kitchen of the world. Um, it's one of the only 12 net food exporting countries in the world, like Canada. Uh, and it has a top, it's the number one exporter in canned pineapple, tuna, shrimp, and rice. And it's the number two or number three uh, top exporter in the world in quite a number of other agricultural commodities. Uh, and not only the commodities, but there's also quite a bit of downstream processing going on such that uh, the agro-food industry accounts for about 12% of, of GDP. Thailand's really well known as a tourist destination, um, and that's one of its biggest service exports is, is tourism. There's about uh, 30 million tourists that come to Thailand every year. That's uh, the second in Asia, next to China. Uh, doesn't compare to a place like France, which is the biggest in the world at about 75 million, but tourism dollars coming into Thailand as an export um, really helped to drive the economy and to give it some balance with the uh, with the agricultural sector and that's also relatively well well paying jobs in that in that sector of the uh, the services industry another export uh, believe it or not is is healthcare about 10% of those 30 million tourists that come to Thailand every year so 3 million people come to Thailand because of its high quality low cost healthcare. Uh, and Thailand was really the leading country in Asia to promote healthcare exports uh, as an industry. Uh, and it's, a lot of other countries in, in Asia now are kind of taking up that mantle because Thailand was so successful, but they do have a reputation and, and market share, if you want to say, uh, in Asia and a re as being an excellent place to come for medical care. And then the third leg in the Thailand's uh, economic stool is manufacturing. Um, it also has some really world-class uh, scale in the automotive industry. It's, uh, it's only about number 12 in the world in total production, but for pickup trucks, it's number two in the world after the United States. Just about every pickup truck uh, that's used throughout the world with the exception of North America, so with the exception of Canada, uh, Mexico and the U.S. and that they're pretty self-contained. All those pickup trucks come out of Thailand. Japan makes no more pickup trucks in Japan, and in, in, with passenger cars and pickups, commercial vehicles, every single OEM in the world that you're probably familiar with, all of the North American OEMs, all of the major European OEMs, and some and every Japanese OEM has a manuf has an assembly a vehicle assembly plant um, in Thailand. Um, it, it's also a world-leading manufacturing location for data storage devices, uh, you know, including hard disk drives. Again, only number two to uh, China. Uh, it used to be number one up until a few years ago when, when China overtook it. It's also the second largest manufacturing location in the world for air conditioning systems. So along with these major world-class industries that have world-class scale, comes with it a really deep manufacturing and service supporting industry. So you not only have the tier one manufacturers, but you also have 
on the agricultural side, raw materials. On in the manufacturing side, you have tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers, and then service companies that support the automotive, the electronics, and the food processing industry. And in, in services, you have various levels of, of supply supply chain that support uh, the economy. One uh, a weakness of Thailand is that it's dependent upon all of those industries to export. About seven, almost seventy percent of the economy is dependent on exports. That's extraordinarily high, um, and that's not looked on as as being a good thing because it it leaves you, it leaves an economy open to the risk of North America, China, Europe economies faltering and and exports dropping and pulling the rest of the economy down. And you can see that exports are not tied to any one particular industry. Exports drive the agricultural sector, they drive the industrialist sector, and, and they even drive the services sector, which is quite unusual because of that heavy reliance on um, tourism and healthcare. Now, because the economy is so export dependent, uh, which, which creates that risk of if the global economy slows down, exports possibly slowing down, and also tied to the fact that Thailand's maturing, it's becoming a more advanced country and costs are rising, that those, that confluence of events is opening some opportunities, we think, for not only in companies to invest, but also companies that have innovative technology to export to Thailand. If you look at the, the history between the two countries, it, it hasn't been very long. There's been diplomatic relations between Canada and, and Thailand for only the last 50 years. Um, and in the economic space, uh, Canada was, was pretty quick to negotiate a, a double taxation treaty. Those became um, pretty popular in the, in the 80s uh, and picked up, uh, picked up speed in the, in the 90s as trade with, with Asia increased. Uh, on, on the trade front, Canada has a, uh, an, an FTA, a free trade agreement negotiating, negotiation ongoing um, with the Thai government. But it not much is there's not there hasn't been much progress on that front primarily because uh, with two reasons one Canada was uh, spent a lot of time with the TPP which unfortunately is not going to happen and, and Thailand was never a part of the TPP but uh, that took a lot of effort on the the part of the Canadian government I'm sure like all of the other members of that that TPP round uh, but also the Canadian government spending a lot of its time from what we hear on negotiating a free trade agreement with ASEAN, uh, which having that multilateral uh, agreement with the, the, with the ASEAN 10 countries uh, probably does make more sense and that will pull Thailand in, into the mix. Uh, we talked about Thailand being a balanced economy and having lots of opportunity across all the industry sectors. You can see we've, we've put some lo logos in the presentation here of some, some major uh, Canadian investors in Thailand, and they really cut across all of the, the industry sectors. Uh, you've got Manulife and SNC Lavalin in the service industry, um, Celestica and Magna in, in manufacturing, um, and then on the agricultural sector, Normeric is here, as well as this company called Doi Chang Coffee Company. Uh, and Arunrat and I, uh, always thought that that was a Thai company and we've just recently found, we, we love the coffee, they're really successful here uh, and it's turned out um, that the Canadians that own it, it's a Canadian company, that they were really smart in branding it as a local brand uh, because they've been highly successful and they've got quite a number of outlets throughout the country and, and it's, uh, it's really good coffee. Uh, on the trade side, uh, it's, things have been pretty flat for the last decade um, there's about $3 billion worth of trade going back and forth uh, between Thailand and Canada. Uh, only about a billion of that, a little bit less than a billion of that, is exports from Canada. Uh, Canada only has a, a half a percent market share of all the imports that, that Thailand uh, brings into the country every year. Only about a half a percent of those are from Canada. You can look at that as the glass being half empty or, or half full. We look at that as being you know, half full in the sense that there's a lot of opportunities uh, to play on Canada's strengths uh, of the products and services that it does produce uh, because there is a demand in Thailand uh, for, for high quality, high technology products. And you can see that here, the typical Thailand uh, exports from 
uh, here to Canada really fall within or play uh, along with Thailand's strengths. They're in the classic sectors and subsectors that we talked about recently uh, in automotive, motorcycles and cars. Not a lot of volume, but um, but uh, but but large enough uh, to be to be considered uh, uh, decent. Uh, hard disk drives, canned pineapple, jewelry. Didn't mention that before, but that is that's another industry sector, a manufacturing sector in Thailand, where Thailand is a very large global market share, a deep uh, manufacturing supporting infrastructure. Um, in terms of uh, volume of volume of exports uh, from Thailand, you've got again some traditional uh, areas of strength: uh, telephone handsets, uh, data storage devices. Um, and and some other types of electronic products. Um, from an import perspective, again, kind of the the usual suspects uh, out of out of Canada that plays to you know Canadian strengths on the on the manufacturing side. The, there's quite a high growth in aviation uh, parts and components, particularly aircraft engines from Pratt and Whitney of Canada and and, and helicopters from Bell Helicopter, uh, animal feed. Uh, medical devices, uh, soybeans and soy meal. Thailand, as we talked about, has a very large agricultural sector. That includes not only uh, plants, but also livestock. It's a big producer of chickens and uh, shrimp and other, other types of livestock, but there's a, a large protein deficit. So typically, Thailand is importing its protein in the form of uh, soy meal and soy products from Canada and Australia and Argentina. Uh, and, and those are those are growing out of Canada, uh, being being one of its strengths. In terms of in terms of the value of imports coming into Thailand, again, pretty much typical products coming out of Canada, uh, raw material commodities, uh, uh, wood pulp and paper, some fertilizers, wheat, uh, but also high value manufactured uh, products like like gas turbine engines, parts and components of gas turbines. And I think now what we see. Uh, as opportunities for not only trade and investment uh, really cut across several of the, the the key industry sectors in Thailand, where Thailand has is competitive from an export perspective, automotives and, and agriculture, um, and also medical devices on the healthcare side, um, but also in aer aerospace. And so we see the biggest opportunities in these advanced industries, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Um, coming up, but it's mainly because uh, there's niche subsectors within these industries where Thailand doesn't have the strength um, and can use uh, additional high technology to improve its productivity and, and lower manufacturing costs so that, the, that, that companies that operate in Thailand can remain competitive. Now we talked about Thailand's um, being a, a, a strong or well-known tourist destination. Uh, and because of that, it's also a regional uh, aviation hub. Uh, just about every major airline uh, in the world flies into Thailand, and the Thai government wants to use that strength uh, of being the being a tourist hub to build off uh, in under the aviation sector, a high value um, industry sector. Uh, with it doesn't have too many designs on doing manufacturing and avi aviation manufacturing, but it does think that uh, because of the Thai skill sets and, and labor costs that it, there's a good opportunity to develop Thailand as a as a hub for maintenance, repair, and overhaul of, of aircrafts. And the Thai government has some investment incentives for companies that are willing to invest in either manufacturing uh, MRO parts and components um, or to provide services into the MRO space. Uh, there's also opportunities to provide, because of the growing number of tourists and the growing number of airlines that are flying into Thailand, um, ground handling equipment and other ground support equipment for uh, airports throughout the country. Automotive, very strong sector right now, but you can see from the growth uh, sectors, uh, excuse me, the growth uh, figures at the top of the screen there, has been running into some headwinds because of the global economy um, has been quite slow. Exports of automotive and parts and components have, have been down somewhat over the last several years. Um, but that's driving demand for 
services, automation equipment, niche automation equipment that can help companies that are located here to reduce their costs and improve their productivity. Things like um, additive manufacturing uh, equipment, so 3D printing, another another way of looking at that. You know, laser welding, robotics, not the type of equipment that you might sell to Europe or into North America or even into Canada, but that sort of next level of automation equipment that's a little bit more semi-automatic rather than fully automatic, uh, because that's that's about the 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 level of um, the level of capabilities of, of the market that it needs right now. In the healthcare sector, uh, we talked about healthcare tourism. There's 58 hospitals in Thailand that are accredited by something called the Joint Commission International. That's the international arm of the Joint Commission from the United States, and that's the the organization uh, in the U.S. that accredits every single hospital in the United States, and I believe they also do some accreditation, or the Joint Commission International also does some accreditation in Canada. Those 58 JCI accredited hospitals are the the second uh, largest number in Asia after China, uh, and I mean, that's one of the things that drives or gives Thailand its reputation as being a high quality location for medical um, medical procedures. And that drives demand for electromedical equipment, surgical equipment, um, implantable medical devices. And the Thai medical community, a lot of them have been educated in North America. Um, they have a, 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 a major preference for medical devices from Western companies, uh, primarily the US. There is some import from Canada, uh, from Europe and Japan uh, because of its, its quality. There's really they they don't the jet the, the Chinese to some extent the Koreans much much less expensive but they don't nearly have the market share that that Western companies do because of that um, the focus on quality and safety uh, and uh, hospitals understand that they want to continue to attract tourists and so they want to continue to buy um, high quality medical equipment so companies that have niche products and or maybe niche products that are less expensive than European or U.S. Uh, have uh, have their uh, have definitely have an advantage. Now, despite the global recession um, over the last decade, we've been we're kind of coming out of it now, and and a lot of the political disruptions that you probably heard in Thailand, the Thai economy has been growing steadily, um, not spectacularly, nothing along the lines of uh, Vietnam. If you were on the webinar last night, but it's been growing about 2 to 3 percent a year. You can see that it's it's trailed off a little in 2014 and 15, but that's in, this is on a U.S. dollar basis, uh, and because the U.S. dollar has strengthened over the last couple of years, uh, it shows a decline. But in, in bot terms, it's been growing steadily, at, again, at 2 or 3 to 3 percent a year. Uh, incomes have been rising. Inflation is very low. Uh, wages have been growing faster than inflation. So people are uh, having more disposable income, and that that's driving um, that's driving the consumer spending is driving has been driving the economy as imports have slowed down. From an investment perspective, uh, Thailand is a really easy place to do business um, if you're trading into the if you're trading into Thailand, but also if you're investing. The, the, the global rankings that are done by the World Bank on, on sort of ease of doing business uh, put Thailand at, at about number 44. Uh, you really can't compare Thailand to Singapore. Singapore is number one in the world um, in its ease of doing business. But, but Thailand, uh, although it's ranked 44th, is, is not that far behind from a practical perspective uh, compared to a lot of the other countries where we have offices doing business in places like Vietnam and China. Uh, and, and India is particularly difficult. Um, Thailand is, is, is relatively easy. Uh, it recently, Thailand's taken a pretty big hit uh, from the uh, rankings on political stability uh, because of the, the political issues that have, that have happened over the last decade. Political stability was, for decades, 
uh, one of Thailand's strengths and one of the reasons that a lot, a lot of companies from around the world were investing here and, and nowhere else in Southeast Asia. But we are finally seem to be over, um, over that since the, uh, unfortunately, since the military coup, uh, depending on your political leanings, uh, things have actually slowed or stabilized somewhat. Uh, many of you may have heard that uh, His Majesty the King, who had been the longest reigning uh, monarch in the world, uh, passed away in, in mid-October. And there's been a, a very smooth transition to the new monarch, his, his son and the crown prince. Uh, is now uh, the tenth uh, monarch of the, uh, the the current dynasty, uh, and we expect the political stability to uh, to to maintain for the foreseeable future, uh, and uh, we don't expect that to impact uh, business conditions um, for for the next few years. I think the, the, the best way to help understand uh, some of the opportunities for exporting to Thailand um, is to give you some examples of the companies that we've worked with in the past to enter the market. We think a, a great example of that is this company called Novatec Engineering. Uh, we've worked with them not only in Thailand, um, but also in China and then across uh, ASEAN. They have a very interesting uh, product. It's a, it's a machine that, that automates the process of treating the beaks of chicks uh, in, in chicken hatcheries. And this, it, this reduces the amount of uh, cross infections, and it also in, in, in improves their ability to, uh, to grow, and they can grow much faster. We help them get into China. Uh, they have a very innovative uh, business model. Instead of selling the machinery, they, they, they rent it, and so the hatcheries pay for the equipment based on the number of chicks that they process. Uh, and that is a little bit unique in a lot of the countries that we've worked with them, in, in, even in Thailand. And it, once we structured a way for them to do that uh, in China, they were extraordinarily successful. Um, it, in just three short years, they went from uh, zero market share to treating over 300 million chickens. Uh, the next market they came into was Thailand. It took us much, it was much easier to uh, structure their business model here in Thailand. They got up and running extraordinarily quickly. Within about the first year, they had sold or were leasing um, over uh, eight machines. Uh, and right now, every single of the, one of the major uh, chick hatcheries in Thailand is using their product. Uh, and some of those companies with hatcheries in other countries in Southeast Asia are, are, have also started to buy their product in uh, machines in Myanmar, and we're helping them there. Um, we're also helping them in uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and now they're looking to India. So again, a niche product that's helping chicken hatcheries here automate a process that used to be done by hand, uh, and it was a process that uh, people didn't want to do work anymore. They didn't want to do that kind of work anymore. The costs were becoming prohibitive, um, and Novatec was it was able to 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 get, uh, offer them a, a technology to allow them to to improve productivity tremendously. Uh, a similar uh, company was called Prime Equipment. They had uh, a type of uh, processing equipment again for chickens and chicken processing uh, facilities to help automate the cutting of the chickens again to improve productivity. Um, and on the consumer side, we worked with a company called Ganeden um, Pharmaceuticals that, that made probiotics that were sold either directly to consumers or to the agro or to the food processing industry to uh, you know to use as additives in yogurt and those kind of things. And as people's uh, as people's uh, incomes have risen, they become more concerned about their health um, and. Interest in nutraceuticals has has increased, and, and Ganeden found itself um, with a with a pretty uh, large market, not only here in Thailand but in other parts of Southeast Asia. From an investment perspective, although Thailand has struggled recently uh, as the global economy has cooled, um, has as labor costs have risen, um, it's kind of found itself in the uh, in the middle income trap. Uh, and, and it's becoming less competitive in labor-intensive manufacturing, hence the reason for the opportunities for companies that have technologies to improve productivity that we think are very high. But 
Um, in terms of investment, we've worked with Kellogg's uh, as they moved uh, one of their cereal bar lines from Australia into Thailand to take advantage of uh, lower costs, lower costs for them, but also uh, the availability of all, a lot of the raw materials that go into the cereal bar, rice, um, sugar, and, and some of the other uh, materials that were being used there. There were investment incentives that were pro provided by uh, Thailand's Board of Investment that allowed them to, uh, to, to be competitive. Um, in, in more labor-intensive but specialized sectors of uh, manufacturing, a company called Pandora, which many of you have probably heard about, um, they've just expanded their manufacturing plant for their jewelry in northern Thailand. They're up to about 5,000 uh, employees, uh, and they've been very successful. We've worked with a similar company, um, the name's confidential at the time being, but we work with them and help them look at what the investment opportunities across mainland Southeast Asia were. We looked at Myanmar, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and they were thinking that one of the lower labor cost countries would made more sense for their investment, but uh, the scales were tipped toward Thailand, and, and they've, they've they've selected Thailand as the preferred location for their manufacturing because labor costs, while the labor costs weren't as, as cheap as Myanmar or Vietnam, the, the manufacturing supporting industry for the jewelry business that they were in um, was deep and allowed them to, uh, to make, make the quality uh, products that they, that they uh, had planned on. So from an investment perspective, Thailand offers, we think Thailand offers a competitive uh, balance of labor costs with a strong manufacturing supporting industry infrastructure, particularly in electronics, uh, the automotive industry, uh, motor vehicle components, other light manufacturing like gems and jewelry. Uh, and then in agro processing, not only does it offer that supporting industry, but there's also the raw materials here that, that companies need to, uh, that companies can use um, to, uh, to integrate their supply chain. And then for exporters, we think it makes an excellent market for those companies in the, in the B2, B2B space with tech, high technology products that can improve productivity and cost competitiveness of, of existing manufacturers. Um, and also niche consumer products uh, that will appeal to the rising incomes of, of Thailand's middle class. And for and for you know for those of us that have been here for a long time, uh, Runrat, myself, uh, you know we, we see that there's a lot there's still a lot of opportunities in Thailand for those companies that, that do their homework, um, that get it take the time to understand the market, they understand the niche sub sectors in the market that may uh, appeal to the products that they have, um, and then those companies that are thinking about investing also that take the time to understand the strengths and the weaknesses of Thailand. So because there are opportunities for, again, for particular industries, sub-sectors and segments to play on some of Thailand's really true strengths, um, there are a lot of, uh, it, it does have a, quite a number of, of factors that can appeal to manufacturing companies um, as well as, as service companies. So with that, uh, we'd like to leave open the, uh, the webinar to, uh, to any questions that you might have. We'd love to hear uh, your thoughts about um, what you think uh, about sure. Thailand. <laughs> okay. So as, hi, 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 folks. This is, this is Josh rejoining the discussion uh, from Singapore. Um, as as I, I flagged at the beginning of the call, there is a section in the webinar window. I know a number of you have already chimed in asking if these uh, materials will be available uh, after the call. Uh, we are working to get them online and are, are happy to share those with anybody who would like to receive them. Um, if you've got questions now and you, you want to flag those to us, please feel free to do so using the questions uh, section of the GoToWebinar application. Um, while, while, while you think on that, uh, maybe I can start off the discussion, Dennis, with a, a question of my own. Um, you know, as, as you know, we're presenting on, on five different um, ASEAN countries o over the course of the week. Um, I know that there are a number of economic development organizations, uh, excuse me, 
organizational development, um, economic development organizations on the line. There were also a number of uh, SME manufacturing type companies on the line. Um, whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, you've ultimately got to make um, resource decisions. You know, wh where, where, do you, where do you make your bets? Where do you apply your chips? Um, you know, wh wh where do you think, when, when public and private sector stakeholders are making decisions about where to go to ASEAN first, um, how does Thailand figure in, and w would it be your first stop, or um, how should co companies and, and economic development organizations be prioritizing their ASEAN approach strategy? Yeah, Josh, you always ask the tough questions. Um, <laughs> you know, when we've when we've worked with economic development organizations over the last uh, you know ten years, the ones that have been focused on ASEAN. It, that's a it's a tough it's a tough question to answer because I said at the beginning we're, we're and you know we're really bullish on the region. There's opportunities across a, a lot of these markets for a lot of different kinds of products um, from the same company. So, for example, Novatech you saw on that one, and you know we've been working with them not only in Thailand but Vietnam, but Myanmar. There's interest in Indonesia, the Philippines. And we've seen that with with the other example that we got had prime equipment. When we worked with them, we looked at the markets, at, not only in Thailand, but we looked in Malaysia and Indonesia, and they also had opportunities for them. So you need to do your homework a, a little bit, look at some of the macro factors. There's a lot of research that can be done online to see which sectors um, are growing, which ones have the, the largest volume of, of business for a particular product, and, and you want to start there. I think Thailand is always a good place to start uh, because of because of the broad range of sectors that they that are that are that are world class here and, and, and growing still. Thanks, Dennis. There's there's a question here, maybe we can go from the broad to the uh, specific and um, th this one is indeed quite specific. There's a question from the audience with regard to the opportunity for the uh, telecom equipment market, and I, I presume that's the export of uh, telecom equipment to uh, Thailand, and there's a qualifier here, telecom equipment such as satellite equipment. Um, I, that, that's re really a specific question, but perhaps you could, you could talk to it in terms of the export opportunities in that type of product category. I, sure. I think, uh, like like a lot of the rest of the world, uh, Thailand. I mean, well, maybe un, 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 unknown to our, our audience, but Thailand, uh, ASEAN, they've t really taken up mobile. They've taken up the internet. The internet penetration, the mobile penetration throughout the region is is very very high, uh, and the demand for bandwidth is increasing. Uh, just as much as, as it is, if not more so than in the rest of the world, uh, and so those I think the satellite equipment can't speak to that specifically, but telecommunications equipment, data communications equipment, um, things that would improve bandwidth, uh, and also for cybersecurity, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, on for the government uh, for the government teleco telcos. Um, and also for the private sector uh, providers of, of telecommunication services for those kind of products. Again, particularly if you're innovative, Thailand's a pretty open market, very, very open, and so you, there's going to be competition from the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Europeans. But if you're selling your products into those mar other very ultra-competitive markets already, then you can compete here in Thailand. And what what's the best way to to crack those types of opportunities? If you're a, a, a manufacturer of a or you're an OEM for an advanced technology equipment, you talked in your presentation about uh, medical technology, medical devices. You talked about some other export opportunities like that. What's the best way to uh, a, approach Thailand for a company like that? Is, is it by setting up a, a sales operation in country? Is it by um, identifying a great distribution partner is it by um, by acquiring a, a distributor or a trading company locally? What, how would you advise that companies approach that kind of problem? 
is step, I think, in any market entry, the market entry decision, the strategy uh, is highly dependent on the company and the product, but step-by-step -step approach is always best. So if somebody that's, companies that are new to markets, we're always recommending that they come in, do their research first, but for, for example, telecommunications equipment, something like that, you, you, need, to, you need people, you need boots on the ground, uh, and typically companies that are, are exporting products around the world have distributors or agents. Uh, in particular countries that know that that know the lay of the land that that are maybe distributing similar compatible types of products and that's usually the best way to get into the market um, if you just want to test the waters uh, for those that are more, companies that are more aggressive yes uh, acquisitions are certainly possible in a place like Thailand uh, in in a broad variety of sectors there are some areas of the economy that are restricted to foreign direct investment there are not too many, uh, and there's ways to get approvals to invest through something called the Board of Investment. Um, but you can use various uh, market entry strategies uh, in, in Thailand. There's not a lot of restrictions on the ability to do business here, but based on our experience, a step-by-step -step approach makes the most sense. Doing your homework up front, um, either hiring a consulting company or, or working with economic development organizations or the, or, or the commercial services uh, for the embassy to get an idea of what the regulations are, what the market's like uh, first, and then go step by step from there. Right. What do you think is particularly challenging for SMEs or is it really a, a level playing field for large companies and small companies alike entering Thailand? Is it an appropriate market for for medium-sized companies who are perhaps a little bit more new to export markets? I think it's important for any company. Thailand would not be your first choice if, if you had never exported before. Uh, you need to be, any, any company needs to be export ready. You need to have a certain amount of, of you, need to, you need to be of a certain size to begin with. And it, it helps to, to cut your teeth in exporting you know, closer to home. And I think a lot of Canadian companies are already exporting to the United States and, and to, to Mexico and North America and probably to Europe. Uh, and so if you've done that, then exporting to ASEAN and, and or Thailand is not terribly much different. You're probably going to be using the same types of strategies to do that. If you're a very small company, uh, that's always an impediment to, to investing or investing or, 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 or exporting. You, you, you do need to have the right, um, the right level of, of resources to be able to, to do your research and that could be either hiring somebody to do it or to come into the market and put your own boots on the ground and, and see what it's like. Right. Dennis, I'll, I'll ask you just to, to jump to the next slide where I think um, those folks listening in will be able to get some of the information about how, how to contact us or, or reach us if they have follow-up questions. Um, while, while you do that, um, I would just maybe close by asking you if there's anything that you think we haven't asked that we should have asked that um, is of relevance to, to Canadian companies or other Western companies thinking about trying to access ASEAN markets or the Thai market in particular um, uh, for the first time or, or as part of a, a, a broader regional growth strategy. Well, I, I think a lot of the companies will look at at China and saying, oh, oh my God, that's you know the second largest economy in the world. We need to be there, or you know India, just because of its sheer size of its population. But I said we were bullish on ASEAN, and you know we're bullish on ASEAN because it's it's easier to do business. There's a whole variety of opportunities. It would be fantastic if every company did business in Thailand first or invested in Thailand first, but. We ha we're having ASEAN week because there's a lot of opportunities across the region, um, both for trade and investment, uh, for for a wide variety of companies in, in in all sorts of in all the either services, manufacturing or or, or the agricultural sector, and so Excellent. you kind of need to look at the the opportunities as a region first, uh, and don't just fo focus on one particular country. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, um, th thank you very much, Dennis, and uh, thank you to all of those who were in attendance today. I know it's very early on the west coast of Canada. 
Uh, it's getting late for us, but we're absolutely delighted to be here with you tonight. Um, if there are any, if there's any questions that we haven't answered, or you'd like to follow up with us individually, um, or to get in contact with our other offices, some of the contact information uh, for Dennis and Arun Rat are on the screen in front of you. Um, just a, a, as a quick reminder, we'll be presenting uh, Indonesia at the same time tomorrow, and our country manager Daniel Bel Daniel Belfour will be on uh, on that call, presenting on on Indonesia. Uh, we'll be covering Myanmar on Thursday, and I'll be doing Singapore myself on, on Friday. So we'll absolutely welcome your participation in any of those sessions uh, and look forward to hopefully being in touch. Thanks very much, and have a good day. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody.